Okay, so um, let me say a couple of words about the next homework set. Um, so the five lemma, this is actually, um, uh, we're gonna talk about this in a bit, uh, in a bit but these are all R modules, the A's and the B's. And these functions here are R module homomorphisms. And we say the following commutative diagram with exact rows. I haven't really defined exact yet, but what it means to be a commutative diagram is no matter how you work your way through it, you get the same angle. So if you do this, you end up somewhere. If you go the same route, you get to the same uh, same answer. That's what it means for the diagram to be commutative. What it means to be exact is the image of this map is actually equal to the kernel of the next map. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So in this one, I give you two problems. You only have to do one of them. Just, just pick one, whichever one, uh, because they're actually very similar. Show that if G, uh, for example, if G2 and G4, if these two vertical maps are onto, and G5 is one to one, then the middle one is also onto. That's kind of cool. Or the dual result, and like I said, pick one. If these two are one to one, and this one is onto, then the middle one is one to one. You do need all those facts, right? And actually, I want to do a, I want to do a special case of this in class where these a five, b five, a one, and b one are all zero modules, uh, and that will probably give you an idea of how to do that. But this diagram chases are really kind of fun. Um, the three by three lemma. This is a bigger, uh, sort of a different version of this. Suppose that again you have um, a commutative diagram. So all these AIs, BIs, and CIs are R modules, and a commutative diagram means that when you chase things in different directions and end up the same place, you get the same answer. Show that if the columns uh, and the top two rows are exact, then the bottom row is exact. Um, and all this terminology might not mean a lot to you yet, but it will soon. I am going to do the dual result uh, in class. Um, so you have to show that if the columns in the top two rows are exact and the bottom row is exact, I am going to show you that if the column and the bottom two rows are exact, then the top row is exact. I'm going to uh, do that uh, for you in class. And finally, number three, and I've got number three in here. It's kind of a prelude to, uh, if you remember last time I told you that I thought that the direct sum in a certain sense is sort of more important for a lot of stuff in module theory. Uh, this is kind of a prelude to why this is true. So suppose that I have a ring commuted with identity. Uh, and let F be the module that is just the direct sum of a bunch of copies of R, right? Over some index set. Could be a big index set or whatever. We'll say non empty, so it's not stupid. Um, consider these elements here, EI, where I'm going to define EI to be an element of this. Um, is the sequence or the generalized sequence XJ, where really what this is, is I'm going to let every coordinate be zero except for the i coordinate. That's what EI is. If you think back to vector space days, if this were a finite uh, number of copies of the real numbers, this would be the standard basis, right? One, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, like that. That's, that's exactly what this is. Basically, I'm asking you to show that this has a couple of nice properties of a vector space. Show that every element of this direct sum can be expressed uniquely as a finite or linear combination of elements of this basis. And B, this is kind of an important one. This is kind of cool. Show that if M is any R module uh, that is generated by some set X, if the, beta, if the set of the elements that generated, if that number of elements generated is less than uh, or equal in cardinality to the basis here, then there is an R module epimorphism from F to M. So in other words, if the number of copies of R here is at least as big as the generating set, then this is a homomorphic image of that. So these Fs are kind of big universal things in that sense. So that's, it, this is not a hard problem, but it's an important observation. Okay, any questions?
All right. And if you're having a hard time uh, polishing up the end of first homework set, I will be around. So just come give me a holler. Okay, so let me let's kind of pick up where we uh, left off last time. I want to quickly we went through all this business with the direct product, right? So, oh, let me just camera here so everybody can see me. So let me kind of uh, put the diagram down from last time uh, for the uh, direct product. Um, so A direct product, AI, and we had, this was a projection map, and this was the map here that called Phoenix K. Then there was a map into the direct product, which we call phi, such that the diagram commuted on this map. The direct product was the unique up to isomorphism solution to this problem, right? Given this family of homomorphisms into AK. Uh, and these maps from the direct product here, then you can complete the diagram. Um, we went to the proof of this, which was really kind of cool. And when we found out that uh, when we proved the uniqueness of, of, of this phi, which wasn't too hard, phi was basically determined by the conditions we needed, we found that this is unique up to isomorphism. Now, let me give you sort of the next step in this. And I'm going to call this kind of a dual result. Uh, if R is a ring, I'm going to call these A's again. I'm going to take out the family. Or modules. Uh, I'm going to call D an R module. And now I have these homomorphisms. And these uh, homomorphisms go in the opposite direction. So let R be a ring. We've got a collection, big family of R modules. We've got some random R module D and a family of homomorphisms from these AIs into D. And again, this is not vacuous because, of course, you've always got the zero homomorphism from AI into D. But again, maybe you've got something more exotic than that as well. But this can be any collection of these uh, homomorphisms from AI into D. Then there exists a unique. Yes, the R model homomorphism. Uh, pitchfork from the direct sum of the uh, uh, family of R modules. In the D. Uh, such that. Make sure that I say I owe to some I equals uh, EI. Uh, and again, what is more, the direct sum is uniquely determined of the isomorphism of this problem.
It's the direct sum of AI. Is uniquely determined up to isomorphism by so for contrast, let me do my diagram here. What we now have is we have um. Right, so P sub K goes from A, K, and D, right? And we also have this map that we talked about uh, when we first uh, introduced the direct sum. O to K, right? And what this says now is there is a map, this time from the direct sum to D, such that the diagram can use. That is, when you do I O to K, and then you do P to it, you get whatever that letter is, uh, uh, psi sub I, or I'm sorry, psi sub K. And this is why I call this dual, because notice this is the same diagram as we had before, but all the arrows were reversed, right? So instead of the homomorphism going from my random module into all these, they go from the random modules into the fixed one. Um, direct product projects, direct sum injects, and the map goes the other way. Um, this is, so here's kind of a little connection. I showed you homework problem three for next week. Notice that one of the conclusions that, that, that I had, I think in 3D, was that there was a homomorphism from the direct sum of, in the case of the problem, the number of copies of R on some other module. You know. um, I will not do a, a complete proof uh, as before, uh, because it, it's sort of dual, uh, except for one detail. Um, Not new. So I'll leave this kind of as an exercise for you to think about because actually the, the proof is very similar to what we did before, uh, almost similar, except for the arrows are kind of reversed. But perhaps the best thing that I should do, and this will help you do the rest of the proof, is let's figure out what this thing is, right? That seems to be an important part of it. Uh, Let's identify uh, what a rather pitchfork is here, right? So, how should this work? Well, your input for pitchfork needs to be a element of the dress. So. And to this, I have to output some element of D for this whole thing to work, right? So how am I gonna do it? Any ideas on this? Okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, an obvious thing to do is notice that for every entry here, for every entry, I can get some element of D. And I know that D is an R module, so if I add a bunch of stuff, so your idea seems to make sense. But let's see. Take each AI and plug it into B spot, and that'll give me an element of D, correct? And then add it up. But now my spotty sense begins to tingle, right? Because, you know, I got done with analysis in graduate school many years ago. 
this looks like an infinite sum to me. And oh my goodness gracious, I don't know what it means to converge in a module. In fact, there might be no such thing. Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do? That's exactly right. That's what saves our butts here, right? Because this is something that's very scary at first, because this index set can be very large, can even be uncountable. However, almost every, that is, in the non analysis sense, maybe all but five and many, AI is zero. So almost every uh, PI AI is equal to zero. So this sum makes sense because at the end of the day, you're only adding up finitely many things. All right. So that's that that saves you. Now that now that the, you know what this thing does, it's easy to go through and check that the diagram commutes. And in fact, this is the only thing it could be. All right. So this actually shows you this is a concrete reason. Remember how when I said we made up the Brex sum, the first thing I ever thought when I was an undergraduate and saw this is uh, somebody just made this up so they could make more problems for the problem set, right? I mean, it seems very artificial that you have all the entries to be zero except only finitely many. This is an important reason right here because it allows this function to be defined. Any questions? Okay, um, so let me uh, let me give you like a, I like these kind of things here. Uh, let me give you kind of a hands dirty uh, kind of result. Uh, sort of a workaday mathematician sort of thing. So if you actually mentioned this to me before, um, uh, when you were asking about one of the one of the problems in this week's homework, uh, you start talking about internal and external direct sums. Uh, so we know how to build an external direct sum, right? You just take a bunch of modules and you build this direct sum, right? What if I walk up to you on the street and just hand you a module and say, can you decompose this as a direct sum of some of the submodules? And you all have probably seen this in group theory. So for example, So a quick example of this, notice this has, uh, let's see, that's awful. There's a subgroup right there. Everybody agree with that? And let me put in boxes here. Here's another subgroup, right? Notice that the intersection of these, uh, the only thing that's both a box and a circle is zero. So the intersection of these two is zero. And um, notice that if you put these two subgroups together, you get everything, not in the union sense, but remember when you add two things in a subgroup, you have to get a subgroup. Seems like I'm missing one in five, but that's not a problem because for example, three bar plus four bar is seven bar, which is one, right? And two bar plus three bar is five bar. So if I put these two subgroups together, I get everything, right? And so Z6 is actually um, and you can probably solve this in 8510. Yeah, this is isomorphic to C2 correct right, so um, let me give you something that is more general. So in this case, we found that Z6 can actually be decomposed into uh, the direct sum of two of its proper subgroups. Uh, here's a more general statement. Uh, propositions. Let's suppose that R is a ring. Uh, and A I, a family of R submodules of that one.
And I want this, uh, this family to satisfy a couple of things. Number one, A is the sum of the family. A I. And sometimes we write A is the sum. And this means, and what I mean by the sum of the family, uh, notice this sum can be infinite. There might be infinitely many of these AI modules, but when I mean the sum, what I mean is any uh, given A in A, there exists I1, I2, IK in the index set, such that A. Uh, a I one plus A I two A I K with each A I J and A. So in other words, what it means for this to be the sum of the family is anything in A can be written as a finite sum of things from all this. Of course, there you know you've got infinitely many of these things, but you can only use finitely many of them at a time. That's essentially it. And by the way, anybody, uh, if you remember from 8510, anybody want to guess what the other condition is? Okay. Uh, for all, K in my index set of these modules, AK intersect. Uh, a k bar is equal to zero, where a k bar is equal to the sum a i i not equal. So when you intersect any of these modules with the sum of the modules that are left over, there's no overlap other than zero. Uh, then a is isomorphic to the direct sum of uh, A And in fact, it's condition B that makes the sum direct. It's this intersection condition, right? So the first statement means that A is the sum of these modules. The second statement means that sum is direct, right? Uh, in direct sums, what happens is you have unique representation. So let's justify this wild claim here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to find B from the direct sum. into A, uh, right. In, in a similar way to where we, we had this uh, function last time, uh, P of, uh, let's see, what's the typical element of this look like? Now, I need to input that and have it spit out an element of, uh, of A. Well, let's just do the same thing before. Okay. Um. This is a finite sum again because most of the entries of this are zero. Uh, it's fairly easy to see that this is, in fact, uh, an R module homomorphism because uh, 
if you look at C, uh, AI plus R AI prime, this is C of AI this, and by our rule, this is just the sum. And the sum pulls apart, of course. And I can factor out an R from the second one. And so this is actually B of AI plus R B of AI. So this is indeed an R module homomorphism. Right. Okay, so I need two things uh, to finish this off. I need this R module homomorphism to be one to one and on to. And actually, and I know you're going to love this because on to is the easier one. Yeah. <laughs> so we can celebrate that, right? Okay. So um, why is it on to? Well, uh, uh, A is in A. Okay, so take a typical element of A. Why is it all two? Well, let's look at condition A here. A is the sum of the family. So that means given A, then A is equal to A I1 plus A I2, A I J, where A I J. So, what element of the direct sum is going to go to this? Well, this is a pretty easy formula. Just fill this into the appropriate coordinates and make the zeros or else. So, let so let's take this uh, net. Uh, in AI, where XI is equal to uh, AIJ, uh, uh, actually, let me let me uh, let me change the index set so I just don't confuse myself too any more than I have to. Uh, make a let's let's call it K. We'll say XK. Is equal to aij if k is equal to ij and zero uh, else. So, in other words, what we do is we take these things and fill them into their appropriate coordinates, make everything else be zero, and notice that p of xi equals ai1 plus ai2. A I K because these are the only potentially non zero elements, which equals A. So it's on two. So I had to use this condition A for on two, which I think is the easier one. I bet I have to use B for one to one. Don't you? Uh, so for the one to one, um, Right. Suppose that is in the kernel. Now, of course, our goal here for one to oneness. Um, Our goal for one to oneness is we have to show that this is the sequence consisting all the sequences. Right. 
right? Uh, need to show each AI is equal to zero, right? And then we'll be done because that means the kernel is zero and hence it's one to one. Uh, suppose not. And uh, there exists a K in our index set such that a K is not zero, right? So this means um, Now, by the fact that this sequence or this net, I should say, is in the kernel, we know that that is zero, right? But of course, one of these. So I get this, right? So the sum of all these has to be zero. Here's the sum of all these that aren't K plus AK is zero. Now this is non-zero. Close something. I bet I'm getting obnoxious emails. So let's turn that off, shall we? Okay. So we have this situation here. So AK right, just setting it's always zero. So this means that AK is in a k bar, which equals the sum of and this is a contradiction uh, as a k intersect a k bar is supposed to be zero. Uh, therefore. So any questions on that? Yes, sir. Does it make any difference if we if we say like the intersection of all the A chain is trivial instead of stating it as the intersection of each one sum of all the others? Uh so if you say uh so if you say that each pairwise is uh is that what you're trying to say? That, that each uh, AK, AK and AJ, their intersection is zero? Uh, I was thinking the intersection of all of them um, is trivial. But I don't, well, know, uh, I don't uh, know if that would work with if you have an uncountable. No, no, no. So, so just because the, uh, the intersection of all the submodules is trivial doesn't mean that, uh, that, that the sun's direct. These are actually two different conditions. Okay. Conditions here. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, How many of y'all have heard? I guess uh, I, some of you told me, uh, didn't Matt talk a little bit about exact sequences? This is going to be, he, he talked about these like more generally. You all were doing exact sequences of groups that were perhaps even not available. Am I correct? This is going to be exact sequences of modules. So, in a certain sense, that, well, there's sort of more you can do with this because, um, you know, the, the conditions on the modules are not just the groups are a billion and the modules. Uh, 
So let me, um, so exact sequences actually come up all over the place. They're an incredibly important tool in uh, homological algebra, uh, commutative algebra, uh, they're central in algebraic K theory, algebraic topology. Uh, in fact, one can, you can use exact sequences, for example, to discern that the sphere and the torus are actually two different spaces. They're not homeomorphic. Exact sequences are at the heart of the algebraic argument uh, that these two are not homeomorphic spaces. So what is an exact sequence? Well, I'm going to start off with, uh, I'm going to actually play a little bit more than what my definition says here. Uh, a sequence of R module homomorphism um, and I will index it this way Uh, oftentimes, especially, that there are some uh, people that will argue about the difference between a chain complex and a co-chain complex. Usually, this uh, way I've got it written is usually uh, called a co-chain complex because my indices are increasing, and chain complex is the other way. I'm not going to really make that distinction at this point. Let's see. Fn. Uh, is called a O chain. So these are some other modifiers that you may see. I'll just call this a complex. If for all n, um, when you do Fn, and then you do Fn plus one, this is C. So in other words, if you compose any two uh, maps in a row, you get the zero map. Right. Uh, by the way, um, this means uh, the image of Fn is contained in the kernel of Fn plus one. Everybody agree with that? Because the image of Fn. So when you put something into this function, it's an image of Fn, and then I zap it with this and I get zero. That means that anything in the image of Fn is in the kernel. It's killed by Fn plus one, right? So this is an equivalence. Again, this is another thing, the first thing I saw it like, okay, somebody just really bored and making stuff up. But this actually, these uh, complexes actually show up naturally in many constructions, for example, in topology. So we call this thing a complex if when you compose any two in a row, you get the zero map. Now, here, this means that the image of Fn is contained in the kernel of Fn plus one. If they're equal, it's a little bit more magic. Uh, we say that this is exact. Uh, R morphisms is exact if for all n uh, the image of Fn is equal to the kernel of Fn. So that is the image of the first map in sequence is equal to the kernel of the second map. Um, so we can say uh, 
we can further modify this since the sequence is uh, exact at um, at AM. So we can say that the sequence is exact at a specific a n if the image of this map is equal to the kernel. This map, we say the entire sequence is exact if it's exact at n a n for every n. Uh, well, I guess that wasn't it. Uh, okay. Um, Now, here's a special one, definition. Uh, a, an exact sequence of the form is called a short exact sequence. So let me make a remark about uh, short exact sequences. So let me make some remarks about this. Um, the first remark is, uh, if zero a b c zero a short exact sequence. So, if I write ses, that means short exact sequence. What does that mean? Let me take this apart. To be an exact sequence, it has to be exact at every module, right? So it has to be exact here. So the image of this is equal to the kernel of this, right? What is the image of this? You don't have a lot of choices here, do you? Right? The image of this, that means the kernel of that is zero. So what does that mean by that? Okay, let's look at the other end. The image of this is equal to the kernel of this. Well. C is going to zero. So the kernel is the whole blessed thing, right? So for the image of this to be all the kernel, for the image of this to be all of C, what does that mean about G? So for a sequence to be short exact, the beginning, the first non-trivial map has to be uh, one to one. The second non uh, the second map has to be on to, and of course, there's nothing else I can say in the middle about except for the image that people kernel of G. Right? Um, let me make another remark. Uh, this looks a little bit long to be a short exact sequence, right? I mean, can't you make them shorter, right? Well, let me point out that. If is exact, then F is, you might want to take a stab at that. That is right. So really, this is the world's most boring exact sequence, right? Because this condition means F has to be one to one, and this condition means that F has to be on to. So, 
So you're sort of wasting your time drawing little diagrams because these two things up to isomorphism are essentially the same, right? And that is why um, this is sort of the smallest exact sequence that you can make that's interesting, right? Let me make another remark, and this is going to be a homework problem for later. Uh, this is another reason why short exact sequences are so important. I, I, Again, it sort of looks like I just made something up because I'll afford, but it turns out the short exact sequences. Are the building blocks. Of all exact sequences. That is to say, uh, for all long exact sequences, if you have if you have an exact sequence like this, you can always build this by splicing together short exact sequences of this form. So these are sort of the atoms that make up the molecule, if you will. Uh, so if you if I walk up to you on the street and give you a long exact sequence like this, you can find appropriate short exact sequences that you can put together, splice it together, and make this thing. And you might think about how you might go about doing that. Uh, I'm going to make that a homework problem uh, coming up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let me give you some examples here. Uh, so here is kind of a, a, a general one. Here's an example of a short exact sequence here. Um, let me kind of draw the way the map's part. If you have an integer A, it goes to NA. That's an R module homomorphism. And if you have an integer here B, this goes to uh, B mod N. Notice, if you compose these two in a row, you start with A, you get NA, and NA is equivalent to zero mod N, right? So, and if you look at what does it mean to be in the kernel of this map, it means that B has to be a multiple of N, right? So there's something that goes to it. Right? So this is a good example of a short exact sequence. Right? Uh, here's another example. Let M be a module. This actually generalizes this with submodule n. Then there's a short exact sequence this is inclusion and this is projection. Right? So this just goes in there in one to one fashion because it is a submodule then. And then you go from M to the coset. So this goes N goes to N. And this goes M to M little N. This is also a short exact sequence. Um, here's another, here's a way that you can build a very special sequence that's short exact. And by the way, there's more ways you can do the map as well. If A and C are R modules, then you get the following short exact sequence. This is kind of a specialization of this where A 
goes to the order of the pair A0, and the order of the pair AC goes to, anyone want to guess? Come on, it's math. Do the easy thing. This one is actually called a split exact sequence because you can actually run it in reverse, right? You can go backwards this way. And we'll talk more about that later. Any questions? Any questions? All right, y'all have a good one. Don't forget you got a homework this afternoon. If you're still uh, piecing it together, just come give me a holler and uh, hopefully I'll see you at the math club. Y'all have a great weekend.